How are we feeling this morning? Yes? Well, I've had three cups of coffee. I've been up since about 5.30. I am ready to go. Let's jump in. Uh, this morning, we are going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we're going to put some stuff up on the screen. But over the past few months, we've actually been um, walking very carefully and slowly through uh, Peter's first letter and asking the questions, what does this text have to say? What does it communicate about Jesus? How is he becoming more and more real in our lives? And then what does this have to do for us today? Like, how do we, how do we apply this to our lives? And uh, we, a couple weeks ago, wrapped up 1 Peter. And so this morning we are kicking off 2 Peter with the first four verses. And I think it'd be helpful to kind of give you a little bit of context as to when Peter is writing, the circumstances that surround him, and then who he is writing to. So it is... A.D. 65, Peter is in Rome, and he is a prisoner of Emperor Nero. Same guy who threw big parties, uh, lit Christians on fire for fun. Those are the circumstances in which Peter is living, uh, and he is writing this letter in response to a report he received, most likely through Jesus' brother Jude, uh, about people that he loves in Asia and a church that he planted there. And the report is this. Hey, there are false teachers that have showed up, and here's what they're preaching. They are saying, where is this Jesus that Peter promised you was coming? He said he'd be here soon, and he hasn't showed up yet. And so what Peter preached, this message, you can't trust that. And the people who are reading this letter have believed the message of those false teachers. And they've allowed themselves to succumb to what those people have to say. And in their minds, this whole belief in Jesus thing is just a phase. Like, well, I guess that was just some hopeful things and Peter turned out to be wrong. And so this gospel message that Peter proclaimed has no bearing on our lives. And that's reflected in the reality that the people that Peter is writing to are now living in immorality. And it's this response that if Jesus is not real, if Jesus isn't coming back, then what's the point of life? Might as well just live it up, do whatever I want to, live the way that I want. And that is the context in which Peter writes his letter. My, um, my hope this morning is the same as Peter's, is that as you and I look at this passage of Scripture together, that what we would know and feel and experience and walk away with is grace and peace. And that that grace and peace wouldn't be just a little dropper of it, that it would be abundant. That it would be multiplied in our lives. That it would be overflowing. And so let me pray before we jump into reading God's word. Jesus, I pray that your grace and your peace would settle and rest in our lives and on our lives and through our lives. Jesus, your word is amazing. The way that you have moved through your Holy Spirit using the vessel of this fisherman to write words of encouragement to us is unreal. And Jesus, I pray that as much as possible that my words would be as close to your words as can be. I don't want to say anything or add to anything. Jesus, just just help us understand what you have put together through ink and paper. And help me apply that to my life and help us apply that to our lives. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. New thing for me, I turn 40 next year, y'all. Readers... Readers are a thing. All of a sudden, I woke up one day, I looked at my phone, and I was like, I can't see it. Looked at my Bible, I can't see it. Made an eye appointment, this fixed everything. I've never preached a message with readers. This is probably going to be super distracting, because I don't know what to do with my glasses. Like, some of y'all, you can teach me after the service. Like, Strider, here's an appropriate way to deal with this. But for right now, you're just going to have to be distracted. Here's the text. Eric, are you good? Okay. We dancing now? Okay. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says this. 
Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now, here's the thing about what the Holy Spirit has written. You good? I'm just going to do that. How about this? How about this? I'm going to do this. I'm going to move this over here. And then that way. You good? Okay. Here's the thing about this letter. The Holy Spirit has put this thing together in a way that one phrase feeds the next and enlightens our understanding of it. And then that builds something else behind it. And then we get to the bottom and it comes back to the top. It's unbelievable. So my hope is that we would just walk through this, a phrase, a line at a time, and ask the question, what's there? And what does it mean for us? So here's verse 1. Simon Peter. We don't have time for this, but how cool, how cool that when Simon, the fisherman, first met Jesus invited by his brother Andrew to come and see the Messiah, the promised one who they've been looking for for hundreds of years. That when Simon's first encounter with Jesus, Jesus sees him coming and he says, Simon, you're going to be called Peter. He gives him a name. And so Peter, whenever he introduces himself, he says, Simon, Peter. And this communicates something because it says something about the heart of what Peter is writing in this letter. And the context is, there's Simon, person and life before Christ. Then there's Jesus, everything changes. And now there's Peter, life after and with and through Christ. Simon, Peter, a servant Interesting that he uses the word servant. Greek here is this word doulos, and it has two contexts in the New Testament. One is in a negative sense. One is in a positive sense. But the word itself, here's what it means. Subservient to, controlled by, and willing to serve. And so in the New Testament, <clears throat> this word is often translated as either one or two things. Slave or servant. And the reality is that you and I, we are willing to be subservient to, controlled by, and to willingly serve people, possessions, circumstances, and ideas. And when we do that, what scripture says is those things sink their talons into us, that they grab hold of us, and that we become, while we get tricked thinking that we're the ones in control, but we're actually controlled by these things that we serve. That's one context, that we are slaves held captive. The other context, interestingly, is that we're servants, and that the opposite can be true, that we can be subservient to, controlled by, and willingly serve the one who's at the end of this little introduction, Jesus. Paul... Paul writes, I think this is a really helpful, um, a helpful example to help us understand kind of this, the meaning of this word, doulos. Paul writes in Romans 6, 19, he says this, I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now... Offer yourselves as slaves, servants, to righteousness. 
There's only one who's righteous. So offer yourselves as servants to Jesus, which leads to holiness. Another way of saying that is godliness, which we're going to talk about in this passage. The reality is we were designed and created to be controlled by someone. And oftentimes we settle for things less than the one who is righteous. Peter is writing this letter and helping them, helping his readers understand that he is controlled by the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus has given everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. And it also communicates the heart of what he's writing. Like, hey, I, I, didn't, I didn't come with grand power. I didn't come with authority, even though I had the right to do that. I came to serve you, brothers and sisters. And who did he learn that from? Jesus his friend, his savior, his Lord, his king, the one that he serves. Peter's just imitating what he's seen in the life of Jesus. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle. Word here is just simply messenger. Um, or if you uh, would go to the next slide, Dottie. One who is sent with a message. And so when Peter, in this context, uses the word apostle, he's doing two things. Number one, he's saying, I have authority. And not anything that I've created or conjured up on my own, I literally have the office of apostle. That Jesus has called me and 11 others to represent and speak on his behalf. And so as he's writing to his audience, who are surrounded by these false teachers saying Jesus will never come back. Peter is saying, I'm a representative who speaks on behalf of the righteous one. And included in that word apostle is also at work. That Peter has a message to bring. That he is a messenger. He's nothing in and of, in and of himself. He is simply a messenger on behalf of his Lord and King. This, this introduction is really, really important. And it continues to feed how and what Peter will say through the rest of his letter. And we're only going to talk about four verses today, but I encourage you to continue as we look through this, Peter's dual identity of both servant, humility, lowliness, and apostle. Authority, one who Jesus, or one of the ones, who Jesus appoints as representative. Then Peter says, he's going to give us a clue as to who he's writing to. This letter is written most likely to believers in Asia, but Peter will say later in this letter that he understands that he and the other apostles, through the power of the Holy Spirit and because they've been given this task, they are also writing Holy Scripture. So he knows that other people We'll read this, and so he writes, to those who, and then if you have the NIV, it kind of, it's a little bit tricky, because the NIV kind of takes one phrase and flip-flops it, and so the reading is, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours. That's who he's writing his letter to, to those who have received a faith as as precious as ours. And the language that he uses is one of, um, one of a scale uh, <clears throat> that you would weigh things of value on or that you might use if you're uh, into real estate that you might use to appraise something. And what is communicated through this and what Peter wants his readers to understand is that um, they are of equal value and weight and worth to him as an apostle. We're going to talk about why. But he wants his readers to understand that they have equal honor and weight and value to him as an apostle. And the language that's used is, um, is similar to what uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7. This is verse 23. 
Paul writes, you were bought at a price. That that's this weighing out. That there was a cost. You were bought with a price. And you have value. And then he writes, so don't become slaves. Don't become willingly subservient to. Don't be controlled by human beings. You have great value. Not because you stand there and raise your hand and says, look at me, I have great value. That's not the kind of value that we're talking about. You have great value because you were bought at a price. When the righteous one shows up and gives his life for the unrighteous, that communicates, I want you, I love you, you have value. You were bought, if you have faith in Christ, you were bought at a price. But that's who Peter is writing this letter to. And the reason that we have value is contained in that little middle part. Peter writes, through. The reason that we have value, the reason that we are equal to those who have been designated as sent ones, as apostles, is through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That it is through Christ's righteousness. And what do we mean by that? It's simply put that Jesus is perfect. I mean, he was a carpenter. So like he miscut boards and, you know, hit his thumb with a hammer, you know, those kinds of things. Like that's not what we mean by perfect. Never made a mistake isn't perfect. What we mean is totally without sin. That Jesus is righteous. And our tendency, I think when we think about Jesus, is to immediately think about Jesus' work on the cross on our behalf. That that is the most Uh, the picture of, you know, the righteousness of all righteousness. And that's true. Like, we are thankful for Jesus and for his willingness to die on the cross. But what we forget about oftentimes is that Jesus lived for 33 years. And within those 33 years, he willingly and time after time resisted sin He always honored his mother and father. He was subservient to, controlled by uh, the Holy Spirit and his heavenly father. Understood that without looking at the father, he could do nothing. You know how long 33 years is? It's over 12,000 days. 12,000 days in a row Jesus was saying yes to God's yes. That he was abstaining from sin and that his life was lived out of the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And so when we say that Jesus was an appropriate sacrifice for us on the cross, What we mean is that for 33 years, for 12,000 days, he had racked up a record of righteousness, a record of perfection, that he was an appropriate substitute for you and I. That's what we mean when we say, or what Peter means when he says, to those who, through the righteousness of God and Savior, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we realize that, when we realize that the righteous one has died for those who are unrighteous and makes a way that we can return back to a right relationship with God, Peter says that our response to that is to receive it. That we just, we receive it. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We don't try to do a bunch of good things to cancel out the bad stuff that we've done. We receive it. And at good news, we say, hey, you know what? This is, uh, this is probably a terrible idea. We're going to do something. I know, that, um, I know that Smiley's watching right now. He is uh, celebrating with Karen. But um, I think it might be really cool 
that um, Smiley, as he's watching this, would understand how much his words impact us. 30 years of ministry at Good News Church. How many times have we heard, it's as easy as? So here's what I'm going to ask for. Would one of you, would one of you, I think this would be really cool, really cool gift. Would one of you be willing to come up and explain to us, you've heard this hundreds of times, what we mean by A, B, C. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be fancy. I just think it'd be cool if I was smiley to watch this, I'd have a huge smile on my face. Anybody be willing to come up and do that? Joe Moore. So Joe, uh, say hey to Smiley. Hey, Smiley. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Joe, what, does, um, what do we mean when we say it's as easy as? It's as easy as A, B, C. A, admit your sins and that we cannot save ourselves. B is to believe that Jesus is our only way to God, believing that he died for our sins, he paid the price for our sins, and C, commit to him as our savior, savior from our sins and the penalty of our sins. And then to believe in him as our Lord, admit, believe and commit to him as our Lord and savior. Our Lord being the new master of our life. Preach it. <laughs> Thank you, Smiley, Karen, happy anniversary, love you. You wanna finish this thing? You just, you just take over? Give it up for Joe Moore. That was excellent. So our part is to receive, and just, that's just such helpful language. Here's the thing. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Um, I have come to learn that if we start our Christian walk, faith, relationship with Jesus by receiving, then we never Depart from that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Peter goes on. This is his prayer and his hope and his goal for writing this letter. Verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter understands a couple of things. Number one. You and I can't create, conjure up, muster up grace and peace. Grace and peace come from outside of us. We have to be given those things. The other thing that Peter understands is that grace and peace isn't just like a little thimbleful. Grace and peace in Christ is abundant. It's overflowing. It's multiplied in and through our lives. How does Peter know that? Well, just think about his story. Like Peter walked with Jesus for four years of his ministry. And he got to the very end. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, never do that. And what happens? Peter denies Jesus three times in his hour of most need. And that that's the feeling that Peter is left with as he sees Jesus go to the cross. Can you imagine what that would feel like? That this is your last memory? Peter had a different experience post-crucifixion and with the resurrection. That one day he's back out fishing, thinking to himself, this is over. I've totally blown it. I can't believe I did that. And he sees a guy on a beach. And that guy calls to him, says the same name that he said four years earlier. Hey, Peter. And Peter looks, and he sees it's Jesus. And apparently he takes off all his clothes, and he swims to the shore to have breakfast naked with Jesus. Don't picture that, just what the story says. <laughs> The reason that Peter understood that Jesus' grace and peace are abundant is because he knew it for himself. 
It's not a head thing. Not a I know about it. It's a I have felt it. I have experienced it. I have lived it. Grace and peace, Peter's prayer, would be in abundance for those that he's writing to. And then he says, and where does that grace and peace come from? It comes, second half of verse 2, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. That if you want grace and peace in a large measure, that that is directly correlated to the knowledge of Jesus. There is a difference in knowing about someone and knowing someone. I was in a uh, junior, senior in high school, and um, my dad came home from work. He was a golf pro. He said, you're never going to believe this. He said, your childhood hero is coming to the golf course tomorrow. So, grew up in North Carolina, basketball fan, loved the University of North Carolina Tar Heels. Chicago Bulls are winning all of their championships when I'm in high school. My childhood hero was Dennis Rodman. Just kidding. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Nobody's a fan of Dennis Rodman. My childhood hero was Michael Jordan. And my dad said, he's coming. He's become a member at this course, and he is coming to play golf. And you are working tomorrow. I could not believe it. Couldn't sleep that night. I'm going to meet I'm going to meet Michael Jordan. I get up at 6 in the morning, pull the golf carts out. I was a cart boy. That was my job. About 7 o'clock, just after the sunrise, uh, I hear, mm, 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 mm. from a mile away, I can hear this bass coming. All of a sudden, around the corner comes this, I mean, clean-looking black Range Rover. Matching rims, matching paint, all black, tinted out. I'm like, this is him. Jump in a golf cart, <clears throat> drive up, hoping that this is Michael Jordan. Door opens, and out walks Michael Jordan. The dude is massive. Shh, shh. Hey, Mr. Jordan, how you doing this morning? Stick out my hand. Y'all, his hand goes up. <laughs> uh, how you doing this morning, Mr. Jordan? Says a bunch of words that I never heard him say to Bugs Bunny in Space Jam. By the way, that Space Jam number two has nothing on Space Jam number one. You've missed it if you haven't seen it. Says a bunch of things. Gets in the golf cart with me. We ride down to the, uh, to the course. I drop him off and, and on your way. Do I, know, do I know Michael Jordan? No. I know about Michael Jordan. I mean, I know all about his basketball career. I knew he was from Wilmington. I knew how tall he is. Met him, shook his hand one time. I mean, I even read the letter that Dean Smith wrote to him as he recruited him uh, as a high school senior. Um, that's in the basketball museum in, in UNC and in Chapel Hill. Uh, but I don't know Michael Jordan. And interestingly, I don't, even have, I don't even have the ability to, if I decided that I wanted to know Michael Jordan, that I could do that. Like, Michael Jordan has to choose to know me before I can know Michael Jordan. There's a difference and knowing about someone, and knowing someone. Jesus, grace and peace be yours through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That Jesus shows up, that he initiates, that he calls, that he invites, that he allows us to know him, to be with him, Peter knew what that felt like. Knew what it felt like to be invited to retreat with Jesus. To just hang out. And he also knew what it looked like to be equipped by Jesus. To be a sent one. To feel and know and live the message. And then go and overflow abundantly into the lives of other people. Peter knew that. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Interestingly, Peter seems to make the claim that 
Grace and peace are so connected to knowing and being with Jesus that if we experience anxiety, worry in our lives, then one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, if I'm feeling this, then am I spending time with and knowing Jesus? If I don't want to feel this, if I don't want to feel anxiety, worry, if I want to feel grace, how practical is this? If you want grace and peace, here is the promise in Scripture, that grace and peace can be yours in abundance through the knowledge, through knowing Jesus, knowing the Father. Isn't that amazing? Interestingly, Jesus produces grace and peace and divine power in our lives. This is verse 3. It says, His divine power. Just who he is as a person. Just him produces divine power. Has given us everything we need for a godly life. His divine power. You realize that he's given that to us? You realize that you've been given power? And it's not like the, it's not like the superhero, which is like the, hey, you had this one encounter and got bit by a spider, or zapped or whatever, and like now all of that power is just you. And you just, it's not like that. That Jesus works in and through us, continuing to transform us into the image and likeness of himself. Did you know that he's given you power? Who's he given power to? In verse 1, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours. But if you've received Christ through faith, that you have been given power. And that power includes the Holy Spirit. It includes Jesus himself. It includes his written word. Isn't it unbelievable that God has spoken and recorded it, and that we have copies of it, that we can open it, and that Jesus continues to speak to us through this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Now, here's what's implied. If you started your walk with Christ, your relationship with him, by receiving faith, then as a believer, we also continue in our walk with Christ, journey with Christ by receiving. And here's where ABC comes in. If we start our relationship with Jesus by receiving, by admitting that we're sinful, by believing in him, and by committing to follow him, then that same thing is true as a now believer in Jesus. Here's what I mean. We've been reading through, um, man, I'm, I'm nervous to do this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, we've been reading through the New Testament this year, and um, as I have been reading God's Word in the morning and praying and reflecting, um, God has shown me something in my life personally. And it is all connected to the word bitterness. That there have been uh, two or three, four times that in reading through the New Testament, this word bitter comes up and, it's, and it's, um, it's almost like God is trying to get my attention when I read that word. And so I'm sitting there journaling and I'm asking like, what is this? Like, what, what do you, Jesus, I, you know, your scripture says that you speak, that your word is alive and active. What do you, what do you have for me? And the, the sense that I get is that Jesus is saying, Strider, you're bitter. I'm like, well, crap, I don't want that. You know, like, what do I do with that? And then this ABC, this thing I've heard hundreds of times, comes back to mind. Well, Strider, you have 
as Peter says, you have divine power. Power is not of yourself. It's the power comes from Jesus because he's the source. And the source is telling you, hey, you've got bitterness. And so my response, just as I received Christ, put my faith in him as a 17-year-old high school kid, I have the same response now that I'm admitting, Jesus, I'm, I'm bitter. I don't know how I got here. I don't like it. When I read Hebrews 12, 15, it says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. There's a connection here between God's grace and that no bitter root grows up. There's a connection between receiving God's grace and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. If you're bitter, Jesus, I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want that to spill over into my relationships. Help. I'm admitting I'm bitter. I can't do anything to change that about myself. And the thing that I'm learning about bitterness is it's simply a debt that you hold against someone else for something that they've done or haven't done. And that second one kind of got me. Something that they haven't done. Like we can hold debts for people for things that they didn't do, much less the things that they did do. So I'm, I'm learning all of this and I'm spitting and I'm uh, right now and I'm admitting all of this to Jesus. And then I come across Colossians 2, 14 and it says this, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, this is talking about Jesus, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And what I was reminded of is that Jesus has canceled my debt. That through faith, because of his righteousness, my debt has been forgiven. And when I put my focus, fix my attention on the reality that my debt has been canceled and that my debt is way bigger than anything anybody has done or not done to me when it comes to me and Jesus, then I am compelled to cancel the debt against others. And so commit like, Jesus, help me, help me today to remember Colossians 2.14. Let that be the loudest voice in my life, that you have canceled my debt. And help me, help me to cancel the debts that I hold against others. That that is an example of his divine power. I'm not doing it, I can't do it, but man, I know that I have been given power and there is a source of life and power within me. And so I want to do life with that person. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Listen, listen to this. Through, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That this divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through knowing him, through time with him, through remembering his promises. And why did he do it? Because of his own glory and goodness. What would cause... What do you think would cause a person to make a shift from willingly serving sin to willingly serving Jesus? Have we talked about this yet? I think what would cause a person to willingly shift from serving sin to serving Christ is when they have been called by the righteous one. And when they experience his glory and his goodness. 
that I have tasted something better. That I can't go back to what I used to know. Seemingly, Peter is telling us that this divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. And specifically, knowledge of him who has called us. Isn't that an amazing feeling? That if you have received Jesus, believed in him through faith, because of his righteousness, that he has called you. And what scripture says is that call actually took place before anything was even in existence. That that call, that work, that promise was put into motion before the creation of all things. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Verse 4. Through these, going back to Jesus' glory and goodness, through these, he has given us very great and precious promises. Peter is saying one more time, just in a different context, that we have power, we have grace through our knowing Jesus. And this time he's going to say, specifically, we know, we experience that through his very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. That you may be in community and in fellowship and in union with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Did you know that every person has two needs? Every single one of us in this room, every person out there has two needs. One is to be liberated from our sinfulness. To be pulled out of captivity. To have our chains and our bonds broken. Our first, our deepest needs, we got all kinds of needs, but our deepest at the core needs to be liberated from our sinfulness and to be, the other one is, to be united with Christ. To be in Jesus. That that is what you and I were made for. And so when we think about Jesus, when we think about his righteousness, when we think about the 12,000 days, we realize and recognize that what he came to do is liberate sinners and unite believers to himself. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Peter is helping his readers understand that when they fix their attention on the good and great and purposeful promises of Scripture, that what that does is it provides liberation from sin and unification with Christ. That when we fix our attention on that, having canceled, this is me, I'm preaching to myself here, Strider, fix your attention, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So here's, if we're going to leave here with something that's next, here's what it is. I want to invite me and I want to invite you to participate with Jesus in that divine nature. To participate being with him, with your heavenly father in Christ this week. And we have an unbelievable opportunity to do that. Um, If you've been following along with the um, New Testament readings, there's a a study spread out amongst these rows with um, just sort of an outline of reading through the New Testament. Tomorrow's reading is Hebrews chapter 8. Y'all, I read it this morning. You know what it's about? It's about our great high priest who racked up a record of righteousness and gave himself from us, for us. And it is filled, filled every word of it with God's promises. His very 
great and precious promises. Here's what I want to invite you and me to do. Tomorrow, read Hebrews chapter 8. And when your attention is caught by one of those or two of those promises that you read, pay attention to them. Write them down. Take them with you. Fix your attention on them right here so that when things over here and things over there begin to distract, your attention remains right here. Because the reality is that sin promises something. Sin promises happiness. Divorce your wife, you'll be happier. Brag about winning the championship game, you'll be happier. Lie to your boss, you'll be happier. Avoid the discomfort of sharing Christ with your neighbor, you'll be happier. That is what sin promises. It promises happiness and it never delivers. And so, in order to agree with, tap into, participate with the divine nature, what I want you and I to do is keep those promises of Scripture right here. And when whatever voices or whatever person or whatever circumstances or whatever happens comes our way, that we would remind ourselves, this is just the plan for tomorrow, by the way, that we would remind ourselves of those promises from Hebrews chapter 8. Because unlike the promises of sin, Jesus has a very great and precious promises that liberate us from our sinfulness and unite us with him. Let's pray. Jesus, you are grace and mercy and peace personified. You are incredible. And we just want to stop and worship and honor you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us more than we ever realize. And Jesus, we pray that you would help your promises to become louder than the promises of everything else that screams and shouts at us. Help us not to just be passive. Help us to participate with you in your divine nature because you've given us power. And that power is you, it's not us. So Jesus, help us as we navigate today and tomorrow. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing.